Hello there! Welcome to Automation Impact Podcast. My name is Edward Slopetsky. I'm UiPath MVP and founder of Active Automation. In this podcast, together with UiPath Most Valuable Professionals and other guests, we are sharing our experience and best practices in intelligent automation. To learn more about the podcast, visit automationimpact.io. There, I also post short summaries for each episode. Also, you can contribute to the development of this podcast by subscribing and sharing it with your colleagues, friends, and community. Let's learn and grow together. Enjoy listening. Uh, maybe elaborating a little bit on what you have mentioned about the, the customer, you, you, you shift the focus a bit uh, on the end. I, I want to uh, also elaborate on this, that back in the past, when you say that you do automation, you like people may guess about the macros, about the scripts, etc. And it was kind of a niche. Yeah? So you, you do certain activities within the automation. But nowadays, what I would like to highlight is that automation is not anymore a niche or a project that you implement the automation in the in a company. Yeah, same as back in the past, like improvement initiative. It is not something that, that you just do in a company, but if you follow the Lean Six Sigma, it is a continuous improvement. And I just I just was speaking last week on one conference about uh, automation versus optimization, like what should go first, etc. And when elaborating on optimization, I was saying that it is like Lean Six Sigma is an it, it's not a project, but it is mindset in the company. It is what the whole company is living. And now with automation, I see the same thing happening. It is not anymore the tiny niche or tiny companies are doing it or some project or service you you receive in your company, but it becomes a mindset. It becomes a style of the company and it becomes the the, the work style. It's not a lifestyle, but it is a work style of each company. And when it comes of to RPA, I I hardly can imagine can imagine the company where RPA cannot be uh, adapted or where AI cannot be adapted. The, the question is in what form, in what areas, but I think that even now it is everywhere and in few more years I can't imagine the company which haven't had an experience with it. So this can you a little bit maybe elaborate on the automation as a lifestyle, not the automation as a project, but automation as a way of thinking and the new continuous if we had the continuous improvement, now we have continuous automation and, and implementation of AI. Yeah, that's a great point. So it takes time, right? Like you, someone won't think about something naturally until they've been exposed to it for some time. So it's a, it's like a habit. You have to gain that habit. So yes, you know, the big thing in the early 2000s was Kaizen and Six Sigma and process re-engineering, re et cetera. You know, I really think that the, the new version of that is happening now and it will be very wild, widespread so that by the end of this year, beginning of next year, you know, the new movement of that will be continuous automation. So it just takes time though. Some, some companies take one or two or three years to come around to that, but eventually, you know, what, what hap what's gonna happen in, in the near future is as a company matures in their automation journey, their workforce won't, will no longer become, you know, operation people. They're gonna become operation slash IT people where they're going to be having the tools around them in order to automate things. If they're not technical, they would have a low code solution. Uh, if they're a little bit technical, they have something that is a bit more sophisticated. So there's going to become, uh, there will be a time very soon. It's already happening in a lot of companies where this hybrid, this fusion will happen between operations and IT, uh, where the normal worker will be this new version, this new operations 2.0, which is a mixture of the two. Uh, and that's when, you know, that's the difference between a company that is, that doesn't have automation today, their operations, people are just doing things, you know, like, like they're told. And sometimes they think of something better to do and they're doing it to get a paycheck and get out the door and go and do what they really like. The new version of the operations people, the fusion, the operations 2.0 is a person that comes into work. They see something happening, which is not efficient. They automate it. If it's too big for them to do it, they, they liaise with the center of excellence and they get them to do it and they get it out the way and they move on. So they, they don't settle for a process that is inefficient. Their job is actually to iron out inefficiencies rather than just come in, do your job and just do the, the operational procedure and get out the door. 
So that's the worker of the future and that's the continuous automation uh, phrase which I really like, which I think is really picking up and that's the future worker that we're going to be seeing you know, everywhere in the next couple of years. And I think that in the last two years we had quite strong natu natural um, speed up of it or, or, or natural, I would say, accelerator. Yeah, that was the world I was, uh, word I was looking for. We had a natural accelerator of, of, of those initiatives in the form of COVID, where another very important aspect which automation brings into a company is ability to sustain and scale processes. Yes, yeah? so we were speaking about the customer satisfaction, we were speaking about the employee satisfaction, but great observation I was I was really seeing that the one thing is when you when you hear about when you hear about this or when you in theory speak about it and another thing is when from yesterday to today your people can't anymore go to office and on top of it in some areas we work with some with one company which supplies the oxygen to to hospitals where you observe that in the process you have three times or four times the, the increase of the workload and for me, it was impressive to see how easy it was to handle it with robots. So I think that another aspect which uh, it brings to a company is ability to scale and ability to sustain. Even if, like, keeping in mind that a customer satisfaction and employee sat or employee experience, even if it is like longer term goal and longer term achievement, but having automation in place nowadays you already contribute a lot to this again scaling and sustainability of your business would you like to elaborate or add, add a few words to this aspect because we didn't touch it before yeah no 100 percent. and coincidentally i was also talking to to a group recently about this there's, there's a lot of reasons why this is happening so there was a a study done by the economist intelligence unit where if you look at you know since the 1990s you can go back further uh, the cost of labor of a human um, continuously went up. So it doubled by the time of 2018. So the cost of a person in 1990, 2018 doubled, the average cost. The average cost of a robot license uh, from 1990, I mean, there was almost no companies around then, so early 2000s until today, 2021, it went down by more than eight times. So the cost of labor versus, so you know, a typical person, average person earns, depending what country you're in, 50, 60,000 a year, if you include fully loaded costs, uh, but a license of a robot is now single digit thousands. So a person uh, is at least 10 times more expensive than a robot. That's one thing. So the cost of licenses have gone down and more vendors are available today to automate, etc. Um, the other thing is also talent. Today, there's a lot more talent available for you to hire, which can do automation than there was three or four years ago. So the availability of talent allows you to scale your programs, which then means that you can automate more of the company. Uh, the other thing is that this talent in automation, uh, even though it's a very hot topic, is cheaper today than it was one or two years ago, again, because more people are flooding into this space. Uh, four, uh, the ease of integration. Uh, so the tools which are available out there are much easier to use today and integrate than it was two or three years ago. That makes it easier to use, which means you can use it faster and easier, which means you can scale. Um, the maturity of the vendors in the market in terms of the implementation partners, the technology consultancy companies that can help you in this space has gone up like crazy because they have a lot of battle scars. They've used a lot, use this on a lot of clients. So that means they can help more people and they can give their wisdom to companies that they consult for. Um, use cases, um, the amount of use cases that automation has been used on has grown exponentially. Uh, this is because of the improvement in the technology, right? So OCR is more available today, NLP is more available today, RPA is off the shelf, AI for a lot of particular things are becoming off the shelf. So if you have more technology, more capabilities, you can do more automations in different departments for different use cases. So that has uh, also accelerated the adoption and the scalability of this technology because you can use it for more things. Uh, just to finish a few more, if your competitors are doing it, uh, you have to do it. Otherwise, you're going to die very soon. 
So it's a question of competitive competitive relevance. Um, if you're not doing it, you will die, etc. And probably the last thing I can think of, and just thinking off the top of my head here, uh, regulatory acceptance. So 10 years ago, if you told the regulator you are automating something, they will, you know, it's as if you've told them there's aliens in your in your company. Um, so today, regulators love automation in most countries because it's actually getting them the reporting they need faster. A lot of less errors are happening. We're able to pick up abnormal, abnorm, abnormal uh, situations uh, quicker. So there's at least like 10 or 12 reasons there why uh, scale has increased and why the adoption is going to increase exponentially. Yeah. Uh, you have named you have named quite many accelerators, uh, accelerating factors since uh, since the last uh, last ten even twenty years. Yeah, and uh, keeping in mind all these acceleration factors, and even I think that it keeps on going. I think that if we uh, check check it again in two or three years, maybe the uh, cost of labor will again get even higher, as well as cost of automation on a not yearly basis, but even on a monthly basis gets <laughs> gets new updates, new competition, etc. So get, gets lower and lower. Um, keeping this in mind, we still understand that the speed of automation in the companies will just get higher, where with the speed of technology it doesn't necessarily mean the speed of mindset changing yeah? and, and the, this change management, etc. My question to you would be, imagine the company in which those changes on a technical level uh, adopted er much earlier than the mindset changes and still you are to deal with the fact that you release the FTEs, you have uh, you have many processes automated and you have many people who tomorrow don't need to do any more this uh, manual stuff. Ethical aspect of it on the company level as a company owners and, and etc. How, how to deal with this ethical aspect of if you literally really don't need this many people how to approach and what is the ethical aspect of it and what is the longer term solution to that oh big topic <laughs> um it's um look it's not going to happen overnight so um it's not something that we're going to wake up tomorrow or next monday and be like oh half the people in the company are not needed. It's really going to, even though technology is really accelerating and it's really getting better uh, over time, a uh, short period of time, it's still going to take time for companies to adopt it and for the mindset to change and to really realize the power of, of this technology. Um, so that will, that will buy us some time. Um, but regardless of that, I think some companies are very aggressive in their automation journeys. Um, it is about the bottom line. It is about, uh, you know, giving that result back to shareholders. And eventually there will be a situation where a lot of companies do that because of competition uh, with each other. Um, and there will be, um, you know, that the governments will be playing catch up. And this is something I've been warning about for years now. Uh, and I do hope governments do listen out to this. So, you know, there will be, I've predicted in the last couple of months and I've, you know, every year I update this that, you know, by 2030, uh, unemployment rates will be something like 15 to 18%. And a large majority of that will be because of the acceleration of automation and companies not needing at that point yet to be ethical in retraining their people and retaining their staff because they're trying to go after the best profits possible. Now, I think the one thing that's going to instigate a change there is governments, because governments are going to say, hang on a second, you're doing this too fast. We're not ready. The education system is not ready. Um, if you're going to do that, we're going to impose a new tax on you. So I, I wrote an article uh, two years ago now about uh, robot tax. So governments, you know, finding a new way to tax companies because they're receiving more profits, they're paying more taxes anyway. But anyway, introducing a new type of tax uh, because companies have robotics. Uh, what they should do with that money, if they are efficient, is then using that money to put it into bursaries where they then allow people to reskill. Uh, and by then, hopefully, you know, education system and universities would have caught up. There'll be a lot more courses on AI, etc. And then allowing people the money and the allowance to go back and reskill <clears throat> or um, forcing a certain percentage uh, of people uh, to be reskilled by the company so that they can be repurposed and being be used for something else. 
But you see, um, this is always the fear with innovation, right? Whenever something innovative comes in, uh, the fear is always that the, the worst will happen. I, I think that something bad will happen for a while, but very quickly, because of the new technology, this will open up new spaces in the economy, new jobs will come up, and those will be filled by people. You see, uh, going back to the labor cost for a second, you know, if labor costs have doubled in the last uh, 20 or so years, um, they will double again in the next 10 or 15 years. It will happen even faster. Um, it will come to a point, and there are a few, there are a few reports in this, a few predictions um, by CIPD and a few other companies, uh, institutes uh, for education and HR, that by 2030, 2040, roughly 50% of the Western world uh, will become freelancers. They will no longer be full-time employees. The reason why companies will be forced to do that is because em employees would be just too expensive. And for those companies that didn't implement automation fast enough, they won't be able to have a margin that's healthy enough to absorb that extra cost. So the option that companies have is to then to lay off these people, but still allow them to bid for work. So what's going to happen is instead of tenders and RFPs happening for big projects, tenders and RFPs will start coming out for doing a simple process job in a company that you do a couple of hours a day, a couple of hours a week. And people who are getting reskilled because they're getting bursaries to do that, they're going to be bidding for those jobs and companies will be picking those that have the most skills and the best kind of bang for their buck. So we're going to move into this uh, digital economy um, you know, the human cloud uh, situation very quickly over the next 10 years. Um, so the way that companies work today, the this, this structural setup of companies, I think will drastically change in the next 10 to 15 years. And that's going to impact society, you know, 50% or more people being freelancers. I mean, that's going to have an enormous impact on people's lives uh, for a lot of good reasons, I think. Uh, and just the way that we work will change. It's going to be a lot more segregated silos. You know, processes have been optimized to the to the max, and there's a very clear instruction of how to do something in particular. And almost anybody can do that process. So people will just bid for it as they bid for anything on eBay or Amazon. Uh, really, really interesting perception and. and... I mean, if you describe it 10 years ago, it would sound so futuristic and, and, you know, far from reality. But nowadays, it's not that hard to imagine it, imagine it anymore. And I think that, as you say, I, I, I doubt that the next double of the labor cost would happen in upcoming 20 years, but rather it will happen in 10 or even less less years, seeing how the, the technologies evolve and how the, I hope also the value of labor cost would also positively evolve to 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 deserve this double or or whatever price and i was i was putting this question by purpose because i mean on individual and the company level it is still a matter of choice when how to approach automation how to deal with this etc uh, but this was a linkage to the third part of our discussion to a government where i think that for the government it is not really a matter of choice, I feel, that this would be or they can earlier approach it by the matter of choice or later by the matter of being forced by economy, by those companies we mentioned before, etc. And when we speak about the implementation of automation in AI in the government, I think about two aspects. One is implementing it inside the government and other is addressing it outside. And I think that the second one is the, the first one with implementing implementing it inside the government i don't see that big difference than in any other company like we can uh, and definitely have a bigger, bigger bigger experience in that and i would like you to elaborate on that but in my opinion it is just another organization where you look for a uh, use cases you look for manual touch points you measure it you automate it etc but the aspect of external uh, dealing with external factors, regulating it on the company's level, on the individual level, is a completely different world, which you would probably not experience on the company and individual level. So let's dive into the second one first. So uh, how government can prepare for it and if something is happening already or what, I mean, please, I think that you can bring more light on it. So this, the, the topic of dealing with the companies, dealing with individuals and how government can prepare for that. 
Yeah, you see, um, governments um, automating is such a, it is, it does sound, you know, like, oh, this should be the same as uh, a company uh, using automation. Um, and the technology is the same. Uh, there's no difference there. But the mentality of the worker in a government entity is very different to the mentality of a worker in a private or public company. Uh, public as in, you know, the company that's listed in the stock exchange. Um, you see, a government worker doesn't have that much incentive to improve anything. Um, their paycheck is capped uh, for a certain experience or grade that they're in. Um, it happens in a lot of companies like this as well. But you see, in a company, it's different. Um, you get incentivized to make things better. And when you do, you get promoted. And uh, when you do, you get a bigger bonus uh, or other things happen. You get other incentives. In the government, there isn't such incentives. It's very much, this is your job. This is the budget we have. Uh, you know, it's very rare to get the bonuses in the, in the government. So the mindset uh, of government, people that work in government entities is usually very much of, this is a laid back job. Uh, it's also very difficult to fire people in a government uh, setup. You know, they have to go through a lot more procedures than you would in a company. Uh, a lot more warnings, etc., and and people know that, and that's why they take it easy, you know, because it's uh, it's a little uh, safer than working for a company. So that's why it's much more difficult for a government to instill that mindset of continuous improvement, continuous automation, because the setup is different in terms of the environment and how incentives are put together for government workers. Um, so that's why in many ways, why governments take longer to implement innovation than the private sector. Um, the way that governments have to go about it is, you know, they're going to have to start making an investment. Um, you know, they have to start seeing that, you know, becoming more modern is actually uh, going to save them money. And by doing that, it's an investment. So let's say if a government spending today 5 billion in a certain sector, um, and if they automate it, uh, they will be able to uh, do the same amount of, uh, you know, uh, services back to the population, but for four billion. Um, but they would have to spend a hundred million in in people and resources in order to make that happen. So I think that business mindset is going to start coming more to the government sector. Um, you see a lot of very high, um, you know, very respected business people going into government, and that's happening more and more. Uh, it's just a different mindset. That's the problem and a different setup. But I think you'll eventually get there. They will be forced to get there because the private sector is going to be so much and so much further ahead than, than the government sector in the next few years. Yeah. But uh, on the one hand, we are now speaking about the investing into innovation inside the government. Yeah. And there, I think that we will always have some front runners. We will have some also outsiders, etc. But sooner or later, the automation will, will, will get to, to and, and AI will get to governments. Just just interrupt you for a second, sorry, because something I, 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 I didn't say. You see, I, I think there's a buildup happening um, in the next few years. There's a catalyst that's going to change this mindset. And now we have to talk about a bigger topic, not just automation, AI, but things like, you know, blockchain coming into governments, you know, that's happening faster and faster. Um, things like cryptocurrencies, you know, a lot of uh, speculation today around, you know, how fiat currencies are overinflated because of continuous, uh, you know, quantitative e easing, uh, printing of money. Uh, it doesn't make sense anymore to have, you know, the current currencies that we have today. So I think a lot of these things are going to converge in very close, uh, you know, dates to each other, where eventually, you know, digital currencies will become the thing we're going to start questioning how the, the, the democratic uh, economic makeup of our society is. Blockchain will come in to make things a lot fairer. Uh, and then uh, AI will be recognized as the, the ultimate brother uh, to blockchain and cryptocurrency. So I think a lot of things, a lot of other technologies which are you know game changing, genomics as well, a huge one, um, are going to converge together. And it's going to come to a point where it's going to be like, why the hell are we not doing things differently? Why are we not, you know, scaling these technologies to just bring things to a different level? And that's when the catalyst will happen, where governments will kind of wake up, throw everything out the window and start again. When we have a new system that is put in place, 
So that's a little scary, but I do believe that will happen soon because of AI, but also because of the other technologies we just talked about now. Do you see it internal driven or external forced? Uh, I mean, government per, per government, it may differ, but do you believe in some governments making it internal driven? Or you think that it would, I mean, obviously what you are describing is what will be definitely external force. Even if government ignores it, I think that they can ignore it until certain moment, but not forever. So I can, I can easily imagine sooner or later external force of these factors. Can you also imagine that the most progressive governments having it internal driven? Yeah, it is happening already. So, you know, China, you know, um, huge respect to them. They're very quickly catching up the AI race and uh, the cryptocurrency blockchain race. You know, they have already their own digital coins. Um, they have already their own uh, blockchains. It's, it kind of defeats the purpose, though, because it's it's a government controlled blockchain. So not really what it's supposed to be. I think the US will eventually catch up to that and they're going to make uh, their own version of it. But I think anyway, that's not going to fix the actual problem. I don't think that's going to be when the convergence happens and everything is thrown out the window and a new system comes into play. Uh, I think it's going to be very much driven by the public population, not governments. Um, because you see, governments are still trying to maintain control of all these things. And with blockchain and crypto, you can't do that. And with AI, it's very much a private sector game still. So yeah, I, I don't know the answers to all these questions. Um, but one thing I know is that, you know, one thing that makes a lot of sense to me, at least personally, is that a new, uh, a new democratic system will need to come in soon, uh, to, which makes a lot more sense than what we have today. Things that actually goes back to value and things that goes back to, you know, setting things up properly and with efficiencies in place so that we can use our resources uh, much more in a much smarter way. Because at the moment, a lot of things don't make sense in the current systems that we have set up. There was a one, one guy I was following for quite some time and still like to listen to his speeches, Jacques Fresco. He died like a few years ago. He was presenting himself as a futurist and he was mentioning always that it doesn't matter how if, if if we have a democracy or any other form of 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 of, uh, of politics in in the power currently. I think that the best he was mentioning that the best way to make a decision is a data driven. So it should not be based on one or another mindset or party or privileges etc. But uh, it it must be more and more data driven. And I think that this is happening partially already, but again, on the lower levels, like we say individual and, 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 and the company, where sooner or later, and, and even nowadays it is happening in some governmental decisions, but more and more, it will be more common, I would say. And just getting back, uh, returning a little bit back to the topic you touched with the cryptocurrencies and comparing what the analogy I catch here is about um, what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies would make to financial uh, financial sector, something similar will happen with automation and with the labor cost, with the, with the work sector and, 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 et cetera. The difference which I see is that with automation penetrating the, the, the work style, it is something what is happening already and happening smooth. So it is like, I, I think that more step by step and, and it, I think that it, it is happening more naturally than with, with financial sector. But because with financial sector, what you describe, I think that and in one moment there will be a bigger switch. You can't just somehow hiddenly to implement several government currencies. And at some point there is a switch where the difference for automation is that it is happening slowly but surely. Yeah. So yeah. Um, can what are the other areas where we can compare this to? If we are touching like blockchain and, and, and uh, cryptocurrencies and finance sector, and then also automation in, and, and work, work style. I think it's just cycles, right? Um, if you look back in history, when you know, we used to have horses and one day we started using cars and a new mode of transportation came to play, uh, there were enormous changes to, to economies, to what we could do, how far we could travel, etc. 
I think it's just cycles, right? Like if you look at the, the average age of a currency, it's around uh, 15 to 18 years. Uh, there are different reports out. And the, the US, uh, you know, the US dollar is definitely way beyond that. So it's time for something new. I think it's just human nature, right? Um, you know, they say that, you know, the an empty mind is a devil's mind. So if you're not busy or if things get into a, a mode that's too automatic, you start just in, as humans inventing things to do and inventing things to make life interesting. You know, it's just that, that thing that, you know, if you want to live your life in a peaceful way, it won't happen forever. You're going to have, you know, cycles of peace and cycles of chaos. Uh, and that happens on the personal level and business level, etc. So I think it's just because of human nature that this stuff happens. Um, I can't think of other things to compare it with right now, but I think it's just to do with cycles. Everything in the world happens around cycles. Uh, you know, you know, birth, death, um, you know, booms and busts in economies. You know, there's a lot of patterns, there's a lot of cycles. It doesn't mean that the, the, the things that happen in, his, in history are going to repeat itself. But one thing that we can say that definitely repeats itself is that things go around in cycles. So it's just time for a new cycle, time for a new world order, time for a new way of working, time for a new way to think about life. I think we, we, for too long, since the, the Rockefeller and Ford era, uh, when automation first started in uh, the automotive industry, which is where it really it took off, you know, we were put into this belief that we have to work faster. Uh, we have to do more with the same uh, pair of hands. You know, this uh, conveyor belt situation of, you know, I put a little piece in, he puts a little piece in and she does. And then we make a car. You know, we've been built into this situation of becoming robots. And I think now with the new generation coming up, millennials, Generation Z, etc. You know, they have different mindsets. They have different things they want for their life. They want to enjoy themselves. They want to go out and have fun. They don't have this thing of um, having pride in their work, having pride in building something with their hands. Uh, they grew up in a different space uh, than than people who are uh, Generation X, etc. So I think all of that's going to force the questions of, you know, why are we really here? Are we here to be robots and to do a job that we hate? Or are we here to do creative things? Are we here to solve bigger problems like, you know, how to uh, you know save the world from greenhouse gases and how to colonize different planets. I think there are a lot more interesting topics coming up today than people sitting in an office copying and pasting stuff. And I think it's it's that generation which are coming into power now. They're going through the, the junior ranks now. They're going to become CEOs very soon. It's them that's really going to say, hey, enough is enough. I don't want to be a robot anymore. I want to be a human. Let's Let's put all the robotic stuff aside and automate it. And let's go and enjoy the human uh, aspects to life uh, like it should be. Absolutely. And talking of beliefs, you were saying also about like belief, like those false or wrong beliefs of we must work faster, we must work more, we must deliver more in shorter period of time, etc. One of the longest living beliefs which I observe is that we work 40 hours a week which is like it is back then since industrial times yeah where you were working in the factory etc I think that we become I, I I'm sure that there are some researches also on this topic as you were comparing the labor cost we went like two times higher or the robot cost uh, went eight times lower etc I think that the productivity of human being increased definitely more than two times, but in the same time, we don't observe that the working hours got even, I don't know, 30% less. We still work the traditional, I don't know, 35 to 50 hours, depending on, on the country, etc. But I think that one of the roles of government is to also balance it and also with the getting more effective effectiveness from from the people and from this labor i think that we also should question if we still need to work eight hours overall if we should still work for uh for for such a long time uh when we are much more efficient so what do you think about this yeah so there's a lot of uh accelerators here we're going to accelerate the mode again so if you if you observe around you um there's a lot of uh interesting situations where you know, there's a lot of talk of three-day weeks now, weekends, 
right? A lot of countries are actually testing it. And a lot of countries have already started introducing a three-day weekends. Three-day weekends. Why? Because we as humans, we're exhausted. We're not machines, but we're behaving like machines. Um, why are all these really fun workspaces coming up now? And every company now needs to have a fun workspace like WeWorks or a Google space where you have playstations and bean bags and, you know, coffee areas, a barista that makes your favorite coffee every day for free. And because we're, we want to have more fun. We're, we're sick of uh, being in that situation where we just have to be robots every day. Uh, can't have any emotions at work, you know, because you can get fired for that. So again, and it, it, for Generation X, uh, this is kind of, we're still in the middle. We're sitting on the fence because our parents were very hardworking. You know, the, the, the thing of building things with your hands, etc., taking pride in your work is still instilled in us because of our parents and what we saw around us in our environment. But the new generation, Generation Z, uh, millennials, I'm still kind of almost a millennial, uh, you know, they're starting to, they see things totally different. They're like three day weekends. Yeah, let's do it tomorrow. You know, they are not afraid to be radical, um, because they don't have such an influence from their parents, which are kind of sitting on the fence from generation X, you know, they can think more freely and they don't have so many things embedded into their heads of this 40 hour work week, etc. One of the things governments will need to do, uh, over time, and this is why they started using three day weekends is you know, the 30 hour a week thing will become normal because if you do that, then more people can work. You, you, you give space to more people to do the same job. And it's a, it's a good way of keeping employment rates steady. Uh, but you can only do that for so long. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to go to 20 hours a week and 15 hours a week. Then people won't earn enough in this inflationary environment that we're in because governments don't stop printing money. So anyway, no matter what happens, there'll be a lot of little things put in place to help cushion the blow, but there will be that convergence that happens where the new world order comes in and you know, we click the, the, our fingers and put something new in place that makes sense. The only thing that I hope, and it, it, it didn't happen with coronavirus, it was a, a good test for us, is when this convergence happens of these four or five technologies and the impact it has on the world, that I hope that we come together as countries and we put this new system in place together. And um, unfortunately, because of human nature, again, this won't happen uh, because of, you know, this thing of being competitive, wanting to be the world's number one, etc. cetera. Um, but I hope we've learned our lesson from the Corona times, because in the beginning, there was a lot of, you know, uh, finger pointing, a lot of blaming, a lot of, um, you know, behavior, which, uh, you know, wasn't very collaborative. Uh, so I hope we've learned how to become more collaborative, but maybe it'll take another disaster for us to really learn how to do that. Hopefully not, or hopefully not that big one <laughs> as, as, as we have nowadays. Um, I would quickly return to also being conscious of the time. That it, I think that this discussion may continue for, for several more hours, uh, but we are getting closer to, to, to the end of our discussion and we will try to summarize it. Um, when you were elaborating on, on the topic of, I don't know, from 40 hours to 30 hours working week and three days weekend, etc. Then you were questioning 20 hours, uh, uh, 20 hours working week, etc. I remember the Batman sample you, you made in our uh, private discussion back in the past. So, and it links to the, to my next question. What do you see as a, I don't know, top three challenges, uh, in, in, in which we will have associated with automation and AI, as well as later, my next question, maybe we can somehow link it together, would be what would be the suggestions if we have some to, to address those challenges? Ooh. Um, as individuals or companies? Let's take an individual company government. And for individual, that's why I use this link, like the Batman sample, yeah? The Batman story was, I, I like it a lot. Maybe Maybe you can tell it again for our audience as well. Yeah, so, um, well, um, there's different analogies that uh, we can use, but I think in an individual level, it's really just um, getting, you know, not being so insecure, you know, let let robots come because they're coming and they are going to do, you know, the things that are mundane and boring that you shouldn't be doing, which companies don't want you to do because it's more efficient and more financially better for them. So just let go, you know, instead of uh, fighting the wave, you know, go with the wave and learn 
uh, how you can be part of it. That's, that's the main challenge and that's how you can resolve it. Um, the other thing is at the company level is, you know, of course, go after profits and become super efficient. Um, but just be conscious of the impact that, you know, especially if you're a market leading company, if you're a, a blue chip company, be conscious of the impact that you can make on a society because you're ultimately accelerating, um, you know, how this new order is going to shape up and this thing of, you know, people moving to freelancers and bidding for work, etc. And then on the government level is, you know, for goodness sake, wake up and, you know, become like a company, think a little bit like a company, try to serve your people better by using technology so that you don't ultimately become responsible for a disaster that happens later that you then end up having to correct. And when you do that, you can never do things properly because you're firefighting. So just think a little bit more strategically, you know, stop thinking about arguments in the in the in the politics chamber and uh, start thinking a little bit more about, you know, the population that you serve and how can you do it better. These are some of the things to look out for and how to solve it, in my opinion. Sir, and going through all our discussion and listening to all those different aspects and what are the, the challenges as well as improvements we have to face. To me, I along the whole discussion for most of topics we touched, there was never a question for me of if, if we get there and when, when we get there, etc. But for me, clearly, it is not a question of if, but only a question of when. It is a question of time and, 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 and matter of execution. So I hope that we would reach this, all the positive aspects and, uh, and we will reach this level without another uh, political or natural disaster. Yeah, that we would be, I, I mean, that I believe that we are smart enough to handle it in, in peaceful and, and, and the right way. On this note, I think that, again, we're getting closer to the end of this episode. I highly appreciate all the experience you share and, 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 and opinion you share with our audience. Is there any last message or the key message you would like to leave for our audience? Yeah, I think it, it's that, um, you know, try to, to think rationally about all of this. You know, you can't control everything. Uh, you can only control how you react to all of it. Uh, so you know, one advice I would give is, you know, this is coming, this is happening. There are some big changes uh, on, along the way in the next uh, 10 or so years or even less. Try to enjoy the process. Uh, don't fight it. Be part of it. Try to be embedded into it. Uh, because it's coming and you can't stop it. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is also, you know, take this time to ask some, you know, life questions. You know, why are you really here? Why are you really in your job? Is it for a paycheck or do you actually enjoy what you're doing? Because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you know, the most precious thing out of everything we've ever said here in this discussion is time. You know, if you look at the wealthiest people on earth, the, the, the people that are most privileged, the one thing that nobody can buy is time. And if you're wasting it doing robotic work, then you know you can only blame yourself. You're a fool for doing that. So go out and find something that you're meant to do. Find something that your brain is built for, uh, which is a beautiful thing you have. And uh, try to create memories that uh, you're going to be proud of when it comes to your last days. And uh, you know, along the way, with all these technological changes happening, um, just just learn, learn and grow as an individual. You know, don't be so insecure. That's my message that I would say to everybody. Danilo, thank you very much. Appreciate it a lot. Great discussion. And I hope this is not our last discussion and there will be an opportunity to share more, no, more knowledge from your end again. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor having you in today. Thank you. My pleasure was all mine. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. We are done. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Don't forget to visit our web automationimpact.io and share this episode on social media. It helps to grow and develop the podcast. Thank you.